Hey, this is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder, with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Today is Thursday, September 12th, 2019, and I'm interviewing Dr. John Cheney, an inductee to OSU's Diversity Hall of Fame this year. Dr. Cheney, you're a Regents Professor here at OSU, an American Psychology Fellow, and a Muskogee Creek citizen. You received numerous awards for your work in pediatric psychology combined with minority and diversity issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Muskogee, Oklahoma. I'm an Okie from Muskogee. And uh, my father at the time uh, was uh, finishing his degree here. He's a 61 graduate of OSU. So we lived here briefly and then uh, moved to Pryor, Oklahoma. And I was raised in Pryor, Oklahoma, graduated high school there. Okay. Um, how about your mom? What, what was she, what activities was she involved in? My mother, uh, mom uh, stayed home with us until I was in the second grade. Uh, she always wanted to be a school teacher. So she started back to school when I was in the second grade. Uh, first school she went to is now Rogers State used to be Oklahoma Military Academy back in the day. So her first associate's degree has, is from Oklahoma Military Academy. And I used to go with her to night school when she finished at Northeastern and Tahlequah and started teaching when I was in sixth grade and taught uh, first grade and then uh, uh, transitional first grade for 30 years. So lots of exposure in your home to formal schooling. Oh, absolutely. I, I was fortunate in that regard that it was uh, at the time, I never realized the blessing that it was, but it was never a question if I was going to college, it was where are you going to college and what are you going to study? So, okay. yeah, I was, a, I was a beneficiary of having uh, two college-educated parents, yes. Any siblings? Yeah, I have two sisters. Uh, my oldest sister is uh, seven years older than me. Uh, she uh, got her degree in mathematics. Uh, she got all the math skill in the family, doggone it. Uh, she's a genius at math, uh, and she worked for the Bureau of Indian Affairs for 30 years of that career. Um, my middle sister, two years older than me, um, is a registered nurse. Then she has a master's degree in public health and is currently studying, uh, I believe, a master's degree in Indian law. That's wonderful. Yeah. How about your relationship with your grandparents on either side? Yeah, um, my uh, paternal grandmother, my dad's grandma, my mama, uh, full blood Muskogee. Uh, her grandfather was in the uh, uh, House of Warriors with the Muskogee Nation, and I believe there's a picture of him somewhere in this library that shows the last free election before statehood. Mm -hmm. uh, I. St. Peters is in that photograph with uh, various others who are signing, I guess, the last constitution of the Muskogee Nation before statehood. So um, my mama, uh, she tried to teach me a lot of Muskogee words, but the ones I remember are basically the ones that mean like, get down, come here, come eat. <laughs> uh, and she's, she was a, a first language speaker and uh, spoke uh, broken English uh, and uh, had the greatest sense of humor of any person I ever met. So. And that's where my lineage comes from, is on my father's side, mm -hmm. my maternal grandmother, and so on, all the way back to the Dawes role. How about um, growing up in Muskogee? What was it like Prior. at the time? Prior. I'm sorry. Prior. Because you, yeah, prior. 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 And there's an H in there, prior. <laughs> I, I'll do it. Um, typical small town, hated it at the time. In retrospect, it was one of the greatest experiences, best places I could have grown up. Uh, small schools, got a good public education there. Learned a lot about just basic small town values and how to work hard because everybody around me worked hard. Um, there was, um, I don't know, not as much emphasis necessarily on going on to get education. Um, mm -hmm. Just south of town, there were about 102 factories in the Mid America industrial mm -hmm. district south of town, and they were. Not that we were groomed for that, but there was an expectation that most kids would go get an associate's degree and come back and work in one of the factories, and I had other ideas. Right. Yeah. Um, 
How about school experiences, whether they were elementary school, middle school, or even high school, that might have kind of foreshadowed, that might say something about the path that you took? I remember them um, like they were yesterday, and it was really interesting. Uh, because I am, uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm a disciple of the fact that it takes a lot of hard work and effort to achieve things, but it also takes a lot of opportunities that uh, you that you needed to be sharp enough to recognize those opportunities. And absent those, uh, I think all of our lives, but especially I know mine, would have taken some different paths. Um, I'm thinking back, and I and I had the good fortune of going back. This was probably maybe my first year of grad school. And I remember I, uh, I saw my uh, third grade teacher. She was there for her, her weekly hair appointment. <laughs> and I, I had the opportunity to tell her that of all the things I remember from grade school was her message that you have to have self-discipline. So I had the good fortune of being able to catch her when she's still alive and tell her that I remember that like it was yesterday. I'm not so sure I knew what self-discipline was when I was in the third grade, <laughs> but I remembered that lesson and I thought ah, she, she was correct. You, you really do have to have some self-discipline and, and see the, the, with the long view mm -hmm. and forego some things and try to step over those things and try to stop you along the way if you want to get there. So I remember her. I had professors in my undergraduate school that I have no idea why they put up with me, but they did and they gave me opportunities um, uh, that really propelled my career and found me uh, some research experiences as an undergraduate at uh, Children's Hospital and I had a good mentorship there. And that's where I learned really I wanna do this pediatric psychology stuff. Always knowing in the back of my mind because of my experiences growing up in a small town, typical small town, um, that brown skin folks got treated a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I always knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to do something. I want to be able to apply what, all my degrees and try to provide those opportunities for other Indian students. And I was fortunate enough to run across people here who were like-minded and uh, sharp enough to point me in a direction of an Indian Health Service grant in 1996 mm -hmm. that we successfully got in 1997 and had it consistently for 22 years now. Wow. To recruit undergraduates to create a pipeline for summer programs to create a pipeline for PhD training for Indian students. We're still the most underrepresented group. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, John's fun facts, the year I graduated with my PhD, there were 11 of us, mm -hmm. nationwide, not in Oklahoma, That's not 11%, 11 human souls that got PhDs factor. in psychology nationally. Yeah. And I remember then that striking me as kind of odd and I thought, I think I can do something about this. Um, so I did. Um. So when you go into UCL where you did your undergrad, mm -hmm. you basically, what major were you thinking of declaring or did you have a major at that point? Yeah, I, I pretty much, I, I, one of the courses I took in high school, uh, I believe I was probably a senior when you're taking a lot of sort of elective courses. Um, I took a psychology class and I thought, hmm. I kind of like this stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it made intuitive sense to me. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, at, at 18, I wasn't sure exactly what that looked like as a profession. But I was a major, in, I was a psychology major from the time my feet hit okay. Central State University. You already um, knew what your vocation was. I knew the degree I wanted. <laughs> I don't know about the vocation. <laughs> I was going to find that out later. But yeah, right. I, I was pretty much bent on that as a profession, not knowing anything about the profession, but I knew that the, the degree and the courses made sense. And I've just always, I tell my students now, 
I think it's because I, I grew up in sort of an experiment, if you will, a cultural experiment that my mother's white, um, dad's Muscogee, and I always grew up really curious that the rules didn't apply in the same places. Mm -hmm. It was both okay, not that one was better, but I knew, I knew the rules that applied at Nana's house, and then I knew the rules that applied at Mama's house, and they weren't the same rules. Mm -hmm. Simple things like you don't interrupt adults. Over here, you're kind of treated a little differently. Over here, my aunts felt perfectly comfortable correcting my behavior. Over here, not so much. And so I've always been fascinated by the why of that. Why would that be okay? And, and, and so I think from an early age that psychology made perfect sense because it depends. And it's a cultural psychology that you're right. bringing into it. It, it depends. It's the context that determines what's an appropriate response or not. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I thought of it that way at 18. I probably didn't. Um, I, I was always one of those kids that didn't take a lot of stimulation. I could occupy myself pretty well just mm -hmm. having a party in my head. We had an old willow tree outside the house that was just perfect and like a chair. And it would sway in the breeze. So it probably satisfied, you know, my attention deficit disorder. But my mom always knew where to find me. I was in my tree. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember when I was about um, to finish my PhD at Missouri. And I said, Mom, do you remember? Um, no, I, that was after I took this job. I'd been on the job here about a year or so. And I said, Mom, do you remember when you said, good luck finding a job that pays you to think? <laughs> <laughs> and she just said, oh, shut up. <laughs> because she would always say, well, good luck finding the job that pays you to sit in that tree and think. And I thought, kind of what I do. <laughs> I get to solve problems, whether it's research or clinical problems or student training problems for a living. Yeah. That's great. When you, um, and you had, as you say, a, a professor or someone kind of guided mm -hmm. you towards this opportunity with IHS to be in the, uh, to intern in the children's hospital. You had really, I mean, your sisters, you're the youngest one, if I remember. My so, middle sister, yeah, the one yeah. two years older. Than okay, me. yeah. So, but you weren't necessarily interested in working with children per se. It just happened that. It happened. Yeah. I, uh, that's exactly right. It was a product of the experience that I had. Um, I, an older, you know, as you know, uh, back in the day, Central was a real commuter school, so there were a lot of older students. So I was probably, what, 22 years old, and my best friends were almost 30 because they'd returned to school. And one of them said, hey, there's a research position opening at Children's Hospital on uh, patient education for kids with asthma. And I said, sure, <laughs> yeah, it's too stupid to know better. <laughs> and that's, I got involved initially uh, with my mentor and still a good friend of mine uh, at Children's Hospital. And I caught the bug, I thought, and, and I liked the fast pace of the pediatric psychology world. Uh, you had to know a lot about a lot of different illnesses and, mm -hmm. um, when I was at Children's with my master's and I was working on the consultation liaison service, I might get a call and say, we got a kid over here that's really struggling with Crohn's disease. Mm. I got five minutes to find out what I need to find out about Crohn's disease so I can get over to the hospital and sound marginally intelligent. I got the psychology stuff done, so it mm -hmm. fed into, it was kind of, I felt like I was a fireman sliding down the pole and rushing over to the hospital to go see what I could do for these kiddos that were struggling, adjusting some pretty significant illnesses. And that was appealing yeah. to me. Yeah, uh, an emotional job. Yeah. It was. Um, it was very emotional. It was high, fast paced, high octane, but I felt like I was doing some good. Mm -hmm. Felt like these parents, you know, really needed some support and these mm -hmm. kiddos need some reassurance that life wasn't over. Right. Yeah. Um, so how did you land at University of Missouri at Mizzou? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, one of my best friends, and I teach with him here, Larry Mullins, 
1982, when I was at Children's, he came through there on internship. And I kind of told him what I was thinking about pursuing, and he said, well, this is what my advisor does, his advisor back in Missouri, Lizette Peterson. And so he made a few phone calls, and I went up and visited with uh, Dr. Peterson before I had even applied several times just to get to meet her. And I thought, yeah, she's doing the kind of things I want to do. So I applied to work with her, and that's how I wound up at Mizzou, was to work specifically with her. Did she have that area in mm -hmm. pediatric? Okay, she had that pediatric specialty. She was a pediatric psychologist, and she did all sorts of hospital-based research, uh, preparing children for hospital procedures, uh, mm -hmm. bone marrow aspirations, burn unit stuff. Uh, to help kids cope with pain. Mm -hmm. And she did a number of other things like that that I thought, okay, this is somebody that can still be in the hospital where I just feel comfortable mm -hmm. in that environment. So I went specifically to work with her. It was a function, oh, and my mentor that I got to work with on the asthma project was also a Mizzou grad. So, it was, but I'm pretty sure I wanted to, to go to Mizzou. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it was a good decision. Yeah. Right. Um, so you've mentioned that, yeah, statistic, 11 Native students across the country graduating with a degree in psychology. Yeah. Um, were there some challenges? What, what, For the students or? At Mizzou, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I think there were just the typical sort of challenges for me. Um, uh, I had a child at the time. Okay. Yeah. Well, I still do. Uh, she's not a child, and she's 33 years old. But uh, that added a little few wrinkles here and there. Well, everybody else has seemed like they're having a pretty good time. I'm, you know, rolling pennies to buy formula. Uh, so, I mean, but other than that, there were some really sort of just basic challenges. Um, I. I think I did miss having what I felt like maybe was a social support group that understood me at a different mm -hmm. level. You got to remember at the time, about the only, uh, I hate to say minority, I don't like that word, but anyway, students of color organization at Missouri was for the African American mm -hmm. students. I don't think they ever thought that maybe there was another group of you know, brown folks. Uh, that could have used it. So I guess I missed that to some degree because when I was at school, in school in Oklahoma or living in Oklahoma City, yeah. there were a lot of Indian folks around me. It felt just like when I was growing up, just surrounded by Indian people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that was to some degree, and, I, and uh, there were a number of reasons why. I mean, I, I left, when I went on internship from Missouri, I came back to Oklahoma for internship. Mm -hmm. Partly for the train, partly because it's home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I just kind of, I like Oklahoma. A lot of people kind of turn their nose up, but a lot of good people here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rich cultural history here. You just got to go look. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I went to school with people from California, New York, Illinois, University of Chicago. They're like, Oklahoma. And you could have gone off to some different place. But of course. Yeah. But I went to school a lot of people that, again, this was a flyover place and hard for them to imagine somebody mm -hmm. living here. Right. Yeah. Now, um, so when you start on your doctorate, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you're even like looking at Native American pedagogical stuff or trying to see what's out there because there's not you're not finding much, I imagine. I'm no, I was I was 100% focused on pediatric psychology. Mm -hmm. Towards the end of my training, I started getting interested in, and the reason why, it always takes one of those sort of significant events to mm -hmm. jar you. I was working, uh, I was doing research, actually. I wasn't a clinician. I was in charge of a $5 million grant at Missouri. We were looking at uh, parent kids adjustment mm -hmm. um, in juvenile arthritis, uh, diabetes. And I had one of the physicians pull me aside in the rheumatologist, pediatric rheumatologist, and he said, 
John, maybe you can help me with this. I got a Native American family here that I'm having a really hard time with understanding why it is that they don't come and see me for months. When they come back, the child's arthritis has really progressed and then I have to really do a lot of hard work. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. I said, well, during the school year, it's fine. I don't see him from June until August. I said, I think I probably know the answer to that. <laughs> so the family came in. I said, when did you all get back from dance season? They said, we just got in this week. And he said, the what? I said, that's dance season. They go, how well in there in the summer? Did you? Well, I never thought to ask him that. I'm like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, why didn't they ask me? And I said, well, they probably assume you're the expert. And you would have asked. <laughs> and I said, am I right? And they said, well, yeah, you never said anything. I said, there you go. So I started thinking, how, how could I combine those interests? Mm -hmm. So I've done a few studies looking at Native American families versus non-Native families in the arthritis population. But um, I was still pretty dedicated to pediatric psychology research. And like most things, I had um, uh, a person here that was in arts and sciences uh, office, Molly Tobar, who said, Dr. Cheney, would you be interested in this Indian Health Service grant? Mm -hmm. She said, I've kind of got the skeleton laid out and what they want, but I don't know anything about the content. I said, what is it for? She said, it's to recruit and train PhD students. And I went, that's how I can utilize my skill. Mm -hmm. So uh, I sat down with Molly, and we, I provided a lot of content for this, and we submitted it and got first approved in 97 for not a lot of money, proved that we could do the job, and have been funded for 22 straight years. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got into that. Thank God for Molly Tobar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was, I, I don't want to say it's quite by accident because I'm not sure I believe in that because I was in the right place, right time. Mm -hmm. But I, I would always been wondering, how is it that I am going to give back? I have this set of skills that I inherited. Um, I had the right parents, I had the right upbringing, and I had the right opportunities. So how is it that I'm going to utilize those skills to provide opportunities for the next generation. Mm -hmm. I had them for different reasons, but I saw a lot of kids who didn't. I grew up with them, went to school with them. And I thought, there's a lot of smart Indian kids out there that just don't. I mean, talking to them about PhD schools like flying to Pluto, mm -hmm. how can we get them early, mm -hmm. encourage them, get them into a, an enrichment program to at least bring them up to even? And this was the opportunity that just revealed itself um, when Molly called me and I said, this is it. This is the way to do this. And we've been able to, what, I think graduated 30 plus, maybe we're hitting 33 or so PhDs. The total is about 39 that have come through our summer program. Okay. You gotta remember, we last year, clinical psychology, Mm -hmm. Year before that, there were four, three of them were ours mm -hmm. nationally. Right. In clinical psychology. <laughs> so, we account for a fair number of those clinical psychologists. Mm -hmm. The challenge is you got to find them, right? I mean, if it was so easy, you just went, I will take those three, <laughs> I wouldn't have this grant. They're there, uh, you just have to put out some effort to find them and encourage them and nurture them and bring them along and get them in a position. I've got a first year student this year that uh, basically his education started two years ago. He's even said to me, I didn't know I was smart. So We're, doing quite a bit of outreach here. Yeah, we used to do a whole lot more nationally mm -hmm. and we kind of changed our strategy probably five to six years ago. We just grow our own. I don't need to leave Oklahoma State University to find a smart Indian kid. Mm -hmm. We got them right here. Mm -hmm. So we have really shifted our strategy. We used to go to a lot of the uh, uh, small schools that had large Indian populations. We've recruited from Arizona, New Mexico, um, East Coast. Um, 
which is expensive. And uh, we did two things. We shifted our strategy so that we're focusing on Oklahoma students, Oklahoma State students more so, and uh, getting at them when they're younger. Mm -hmm. We wait till they're juniors or seniors, sometimes it's too late. So we now have students who are freshmen who are in, in our program. Mm -hmm. And we go visit immersion schools, still in the state, mm -hmm. Cherokee Nation and others, mm -hmm. uh, so that people know who we are, so they can send us students. That sounds great. So when you first got here, what was your position your, you were hired as? Here? Mm -hmm. Oh, I was hired as a rank and file assistant professor. Okay. <laughs> Bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Nowhere to go but up or out. <laughs> um, and was was Dr. Kozer here at the time? He was the first person okay. I ever met. He was the first person you met on I campus. was on the internship and uh -huh. the director of clinical training uh -huh. in the psych department. His wife worked at Children's Hospital. Oh, that's right. And he said, uh, would you like to have lunch? I said, sure. I'm a poor intern. Free lunch, <laughs> you kid. Um, and he said, We're, uh, we have a position open next week or next year that we've got some funding for somebody who has your background in family systems therapy and your pediatric psychology research, would you be interested in the job? I had envisioned myself working in a teaching hospital. Mm. And I came to Oklahoma State, who rejected me as a PhD student, by the way. <laughs> I came here for my informal interview, so I met Pete. Right. I met the president of the university, Dr. Campbell, mm -hmm. uh, who was quite interested in the fifth down fiasco that Missouri just got ripped off <laughs> against Colorado. Uh, I, it would feel like an informal interview, and then I came back after Christmas and did a, a job talk and a colloquium and all that and interviews and got the job. And I had not planned on being here this whole time, but I'm starting my 29th year. Yeah. That's that's it's a great place. Yes. Um, so what have been some of the career highlights for you so far? Well, of course, the grant. Mm -hmm. um, now, an interesting story, and I don't want to take too long, but the gentleman who paced the halls of Senate to get these dollars, um, um, is the father of the other gentleman who has his program at Montana. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I can say names or not. It's Art McDonald. Okay. Been you decorated by <laughs> so there you go. Been decorated by APA for all of his efforts yeah. in, in education and minority students. Right. He he worked the, the halls of Congress for years to get this type of program approved by Congress and into the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. And he came here for, I was here for the American Psychological Association site visit in 94 or 5. And he said, I want to meet with Dr. Cheney individually. Well, I didn't really know Dr. McDonald at the time. He came in my office and he said, where are all the Indian students? I said, well, Art, I don't know. He goes, well, you know. 94, we're going to have this approved by Congress. The first funds go out in 95, and it's to bring Indian students into PhD programs. And I said, well, Art, I'll tell you what. I've been around the track long enough to know that until I'm tenured, that's a waste of time. A waste of time? I said, yes, because it does not produce the kind of beans that get counted for tenure. And if I do that, in two years, I'm out of a job, and it was a waste of effort. So I was tenured in 96 and got the grant in 97. Wow. So definitely. I was true to my word. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. I need, to, I really do need to do that. But I said, Art, I've seen so many Native, Native faculty members go mm -hmm. by the wayside because a lot of times that type of effort does not produce the beans that get counted mm -hmm. in an academic way. Well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm supposed to have publication. Mm -hmm. Those, that grant does not produce those. And I said, it just seemed like a wasted effort to spend my years that I could be getting tenured mm -hmm. 
So I have the long view. Right. Or right. I spend it doing that and in five years I'm out of a job and I'm looking somewhere else. It just doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. Worked out well. It worked out around. very well. And I called them. I called them and said, the Indian students are here now, Mark. I got to be really good friends with him. I said, come come visit us and you'll see the Indian students now. We uh -huh. got them. And I'm tenured, so I'm going to be here a while. Right, right. Um, how was it to uh, find out that you got your regent professorship? And what year did that happen in? Oh, I'm Let's see, Regents Professor was 2013? Okay. I don't know. <laughs> Look at my video. <laughs> I think it was 2013. I'm pretty sure it was. There about 2013 or 14. Well, it, it, it was a real honor to be recognized by the institution that I've spent my whole career to be recognized for excellence. Mm -hmm. um, to have received, I guess, the highest honor that is given to a faculty member. Uh, that ain't too bad from an old boy from Prior, Oklahoma. <laughs> Prior, Oklahoma. Uh, I can guarantee you nobody would have predicted that, including me. So it was very much an honor. I never, I, 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 it's really funny, and you can ask people who know me, I'm really kind of, embarrassed when I get those things because I don't do it for that. I do it for kind of love to do the work that's involved in my job. Mm -hmm. And so I, it's, they can, for me, I, I blush. I'm not usually a bashful person, but it's like, you know, the, go to the next one. I'll <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, um, a university setting is a complex place to work and I'm wondering <laughs> what, are some C of the, complex. <laughs> what are some of the challenges of that and what have been some of the rewards of that navigating that I think some of the the challenges that I face um, and, and again, I'm not, it, it's not meant to be critical. It's just meant that I, it was my job to educate people. Mm -hmm. That having grants to train Indian students is the same as any grant to go conduct research or do anything else. The money's still green. Um, and so I think it was looked upon as something less than for the longest time. Oh, I know that you do that stuff. It's like, that stuff brings in $1.2 million every five years to the university. I don't think the president minds that it's for this, that, or the other thing. But so I had to kind of swim upstream for a little bit. But again, uh, wise enough or, or just naive enough uh, that I knew that I needed the support of my faculty if I was going to make this successful. So I've always folded them in. They teach in my summer program. Uh, they do our didactics. They do clinical presentations, they take on these students for the summer to be their mentors. And then up until about maybe four or five years ago, they did it all voluntarily. You really got an investment from them. I got a, I got a buy-in from them that now that program is seen as just an integral part of the psychology program. You can go by that office any day and it looks like United Nations in there. We got all color kids in there. And I, that's what you want. You want a place where kids feel supported and safe. Mm -hmm. And they stop in, and so everybody's friends. And the Indian kids are not segregated over in a corner. This has just become an integral part of what Oklahoma State University psychology is. Mm -hmm. It's based on diversity and inclusion. Not just the Indian kids, all kids. Mm -hmm. But I think having that distinction and putting your money where your mouth is helps. Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge early on, but that was very short term. I mean, the usual the other challenges I found, I don't think they're any different than anybody else, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always worked hard to whisper into the administrator's ears that we need more Indian faculty members. Uh, we have two now. We were up to three a few years ago, and somebody decided to leave. It had nothing to do with not getting in. They, mm -hmm. It was other reasons, but um, I, I, it, it's meaningful for me to have as many individuals in that department that represent the student body out here. Mm -hmm. We have a great representation of female faculty members, African-American faculty members. 
-hmm. And now we have two, like I said, had three mm -hmm. um, Native American faculty members, um, uh, tribal citizens. Mm -hmm. So that's meaningful for me, but I realize that that's, it's not just the numbers, it's who you get to. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about just having, oh, we got five of them, we're done. That's, that's and you've been pretty involved with the Native Studies track or program too. Well, um, you know, in 2010, late 2010, um, Dean Sherwood approached a number of folks and asked, we really need someone to take over as director of American Indian Studies, as dying on the vine. Um, you know, we used to be a certificate program and now it's a minor, but nobody seems to know exactly what the curriculum is. And I thought, don't do it, don't do it. Okay, <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> it was hard for me. I had a lot of respect for Dr. Sherwood and it needed to be done. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? <laughs> Very. Um, because it was really difficult uh, at first just to find out who I was teaching courses that would count toward the minor and then sitting down with wonderful Amy Martindale uh, helped me put together the degree sheet and we got it shaped up and we really, really rolled it out formally in the fall of 2012. Mm -hmm. And I think in those, what is that, about, no, I, I would say a good I could only know through last year, six years, we've had close to 40 kids declare the minor, mm -hmm. which isn't great, it's not terrible either. No. It's better than zero <laughs> that we had in 2011. Um, so yeah, I've been very involved in that. We're currently working on, we've added three new courses to the curriculum. We have great support staff in history, geography, and in English, mm -hmm. uh, and art who we've got a core group of folks that meet and we had a call this morning about offering, uh, in addition to Muscogee language, offering Cherokee language, hopefully in the fall of 2020, it'll be online, but it'll be also video. Um, so a number of students have asked about how can we add more language? And so we listened and we had, we had that conversation this morning. We're supposed to meet with some under secretaries as well as the chief because he wants to be involved. That's one of his issues is advancing culture and language. So within the next month or so, we'll probably do that and keep moving. So gosh, how hard can that be? <laughs> I got that answer pretty quick, but it's been enjoyable. I love being around the students because uh, we're co-located with the Center for Sovereign Nations. Right. And so it's always a treat to, I just like being around really bright kids and I'm so encouraged to see so many bright Indian kids here. Uh, does my heart good. Um, what are one or two of the most important things you try to pass on to students? You have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm asked to go talk at, let's say, the Native American Student Association graduation, I tell them all, don't stop me if you've heard this, but I know you have. You leave the ladder down. I mean, you're... You, um, you're never done. It's, this is a starting line. You, I, I mean, I literally, I, I don't know where this comes from, um, but I, I cannot imagine a more meaningful legacy than to provide opportunities for the next generation, recognizing that just two generations above me, those opportunities were there. Mm -hmm. Awesome opportunities that these kids have. Mm -hmm. And I try to explain to them without getting too melodramatic, but I say, y'all need to realize people literally died for you to have this opportunity. Don't blow it. Whereas my dad said when I went to college, don't be stupid. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. No, but you know, pay attention. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you do have a sense, there is a sense of responsibility. And I know a lot of you don't have to be Indian to feel that. But I think more so for Indians, it's like, no, we, we, you have an obligation for the next generation. You have an opportunity to change that narrative mm -hmm. for the next however many generations. Why would you not? The opportunity's there. Just say yes. Well, go the, I tell them, go the extra mile. You will not find any traffic jam there. 
it, so you don't worry about it. I said, if you go the extra mile, it's a lonely road, but you're doing, you're doing good. You change the narrative for the next generation and then their kids and their kids and before too long. It just becomes part of what you're supposed to do rather than being an exception to the rule. Um, so I have a lot to say to the <laughs> students and they get tired of it, but I, I mean I mean that. Um, this is the starting line for y'all when you leave. You know, don't pull the ladder up after you. Shame on you, don't do that. Because you wouldn't be here if others had done that. So you, you do have an obligation uh, for the kiddos, whether they're your younger brother or sister or just the next generation of kids yet to be born or whatever. You know, leave a little on the table for them. Right. Yeah. What's one of the important lessons you've learned from your students over the years? That I don't know everything. <laughs> 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 um, life's gotten a lot simpler since I realized it. I, what, you know, but the important things beyond that, I mean, it's always fun to be around people smarter than you. Um, but what I've really learned from them is a real appreciation for the hard work and effort and the sincerity that they have in trying to do some good, uh, native students, non-native students. But I do marvel at some of the, 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 the native kids and I think, man, I think I would have folded by now. What they've overcome to get here, just to get to zero, right. just to get even, I just go, because I don't know if I'm, I would have had that strength of character or not. And I just go, which inspires me to work even harder. But I think they've shown me that, wow, I mean, uh, kids can overcome a lot. And a lot of times it only takes one thing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to move a mountain, just help them find a way around the mountain. I mean, you don't have to move heaven and earth. And sometimes it's just one thing, mm -hmm. one small thing. Mm -hmm. um, I was talking to my wife about that. Kid dropped a cell phone in the water during a storm. And he couldn't text his homework. The kid's ready to leave school. Now, I mean, it, and what do you do? You know, you find a way to talk to family and you get them a phone to get them through the next two weeks or or the kids gonna leave school how hard is that mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't take a lot it just change life and now this kid's off making more money than i do as an engineer and i'm like hey can i borrow money <laughs> um but I, I do marvel at daily almost if not certainly weekly when i watch these kids and i hear where they came from that I go, mm, I need to just shut up. I need to quit griping. I got it pretty good, you know, and I had it pretty good. You know, well, it's just it's amazing to me, Julie, in 2019 that we got this many first generation college students. It's like, mm -hmm. when is that going to end? Um, and I'm, I am still amazed by that that a lot of these kiddos, and so they they don't have a lot of support. You don't want a kid to leave school because they don't know what a bursar is. Mm -hmm. And they're too embarrassed to ask somebody. So they leave school. And I asked their parents, because their parents didn't go to school. Can't ask an uncle and aunt and uncle because they didn't go to school. Who are you going to ask? You're going to show, you're going to embarrass yourself and ask somebody that does not look like you what is a bursar and where is it? Probably mm -hmm. not. We can fix that. Right. Yeah. We'll fix that. Well, um, congratulations on being chosen for the OSU Diversity Hall of Fame. Um, it's an honor, let me tell that? you. It, it, is, it is a genuine honor. Um, it means a lot to me. Of all the things that I've done in my career, the fact that, it, again, it's kind of embarrassing because I see it as such a team effort. I mean, I have a very supportive cast in that psychology department, and the support for my program goes all the way to the dean's office, to the president's office. Um, so it's very much a team effort. I mean, I'm not giving it back. <laughs> I'm keeping it. But uh, again, I'm also pretty humble to know that yeah, I wouldn't, I would 
to be where I am if it weren't for the support of a lot of people around me. I mean, I don't mean growing up, I mean where I work right now. Right, you know? right. Well, is there anything we didn't talk about or anything you'd like to add that we didn't get to cover? I think that's pretty thorough. I just appreciate the opportunity to to chat with you. I mean, I'm very honored by by the award, and uh, uh, I mean, I look at the company I'm in when I see who else has won it. Big company. (laughs) Sure, y'all didn't make a mistake. It's John Cheney. Yeah, no. So I'm I'm humbled by it as well because I am very well aware of some of those folks who are recipients of this award previously. And even uh, contemporaneously, uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Perry, I've known I knew her my whole career here. That helped her a lot. Esteem. Well, thank you very much for your time today. You bet.